Good afternoon, and welcome to Pivot Point, a show bringing you diverse views on the news. I'm your host, Maya Rockymore. Well, the president's budget uh, will be released this week. This is this 2013 budget, uh, a document that many people have been waiting for with bated breath. And I've got to tell you, the reaction uh, in Washington and around the nation has been explosive. Uh, the new budget would lead to uh, approximately $1.8 trillion in savings over 10 years. And it would seek to replace the forced budget cuts that came about as a result of the sequester. But is this what the voters bargained for uh, when they reelected President Obama in 2012? Let's listen to what President Obama actually had to say about the issue of Social Security and Medicare in 2008. Gone even further, suggesting that the best answer for the growing pressures on Social Security might be to cost, uh, might be to cut cost of living adjustments or raise the retirement age. Now, let me be clear, I will not do either. Now, let's, let's repeat that. The president said that he wanted to be clear in 2008 that he would not cut Social Security, that he would not cut benefits in Social Security. And yet, this current budget uh, is, is expected to include up to $400 billion in cuts to Medicare and up to $130 billion in cuts to Social Security and other government-issued benefits through the implementation of a strategic move called the Chain CPI. Now, the White House is calling this move a superlative CPI, and we're going to get into this conversation with a panel of experts later in the show. But to suffice it to say, this cut is uh, indeed uh, a reduction in benefits under Social Security. It's a reduction in benefits for those who receive veterans benefits, uh, and it is a cut, and an across the board cut, in which they're trying to save $130 billion off of the backs of working uh, middle class Americans uh, across the nation who have earned these benefits. And so, again, we've got to ask, is this what the voters bargained for? Ironically, many voters were hoping that the Obama administration's conservative tendencies uh, in his first term uh, would actually flip in the second term, that he would indeed become more pro progressive in his proposals. But this budget actually raises questions about this, the, the administration's second term strategy. So I am pleased that this uh, this show, we will focus the entire show on the president's budget, what it means for the people, what it means for current seniors who are currently on Social Security, uh, what it means for veterans and other people who are relying on government issued benefits, and certainly what it means for the future of Medicare. Uh, we will have uh, at the top of the show Alan Grayson. He is a, an elected representative serving in the United States Congress from Florida's 9th Congressional District. And later on, we will actually have a panel. And I actually think that this is a Harvard reunion of sorts because every guest we're having on the show today uh, either went to undergrad or law school at Harvard University. Damon Silvers, uh, we will have him. He is the director of policy and special counsel for the AFL-CIO. Uh, he joined the AFL-CIO as the associate counsel in 1997. We'll also be joined by Max Richmond, a former staff director uh, for the Senate Special Committee on Aging and a 16-year Capitol Hill veteran. Uh, he is currently the president and CEO of the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. And we'll also have Nancy Altman. She is a 35-year uh, expert in the area of Social Security and private pensions, and she co-directs Social Security Works. And so we are looking forward to this exciting panel. But first, Alan Grayson. Congressman Grayson recently returned to Capitol Hill after serving uh, a, a several terms in Congress representing Florida's 8th Congressional District from 2009 to 2011. And, and like his last term in office, Congressman Grayson has come out fighting, fighting on behalf of the people. And so it is my pleasure uh, to welcome to the show Congressman Alan Grayson. Welcome, Congressman. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. Listen, you have not been shy about suggesting that the president's grand bargain is a grand betrayal. How so? Well, with regard to the specific cuts that you're describing, let's talk about what they actually mean. These are not cuts that make the programs more efficient. Uh, these are not cuts <clears throat> that ran in the pharmaceutical industry, which uh, has been accused of overcharging on drugs. These are not cuts that uh, attack fraud in the programs. These are cuts in benefits. And I think that there's a fundamental distinction between 
cutting the benefits, breaking the promise, versus uh, making the programs more efficient. The president's chained CPI proposal uh, for Social Security will end up within 10 years reducing Social Security benefits by $1,000 a year for every single Social Security recipient. It's just a matter of math. And that's wrong. We, we have indicated to people that if they work uh, for 30, 40 years, however long it might be, and help other people and to pay for their benefits, then they'll be entitled to those benefits. And instead, what we're telling people is uh, you'll get uh, uh, some slice of those benefits that you're working to pay for other people for, but you won't get your full benefits. The same thing is true of veterans. The veterans' benefits are calculated in exactly the same manner. Um, I think it's cheating. I mean, if you look at what the president's actually proposing, he's trying to put lipstick on this big by calling it superlative CPI. I don't even know what the heck that means. But what it means is it's less. And it's less for a particular reason that's almost malevolent. Uh, let's say, for instance, that the cost of gas goes from $4 a gallon to $8 a gallon. Mm -hmm. Most people would regard that as a 100% increase in the cost of living for gas. What the president's proposing is that if gas goes to $8 a gallon, obviously some people aren't going to be able to afford to drive to work anymore. They're going to have to walk to work. So what they're going to do is reduce the gasoline component of the CPI and increase the shoe leather, leather, leather component of the CPI uh, to make up for that. And that's nonsense. I mean, a $4 to $8 increase is 100% in the, in the minds and eyes of virtually everyone who, who gets benefits like this or who matters or was willing to apply common sense. And the president is trying to finesse that uh, in order to justify a cut in benefits. It's wrong. The Social Security system does not add one penny, not one penny to our deficit. The Social Security system is run at a surplus every single year since it was created in the 1930s, um, it now has a $1.8 trillion surplus in the bank. In fact, it's the largest sovereign right. wealth fund in the entire world. And the president is doing this in order to justify increases in military spending. We're cutting Social Security, cheating our seniors in order to have increase in military spending under his budget. So I think it's wrong. This is interesting because I'd like to unpack this. Uh, by law, Social Security cannot contribute to the deficit debt. Uh, and yet uh, we have uh, the administration and others saying that in order to rein in our long-term debt, we actually need to cut Social Security benefits. Can you explain to our listening audience why this, uh, this seeming contradiction is, is, why it's being sold this way? Well, this is what's known as a lie. It's a lie. Uh, the Social Security Administration has a vast, huge surplus that it's sitting on. And, in fact, it will run surpluses from now until the year 2037. I'm 55 years old. I'll be, what, 79 years old in the year 2037? I'm not sure that that's really crucial to me uh, at any point. Uh, but even at that point, after that point, the Social Security Administration will still, under current law, with current projections and current benefit levels, still after the year 2037, still be able to pay at least 75% or more of benefits under current laws. So it's 100% until a quarter of a century from now, and then 75% plus until after, uh, after that point. And there's so many different ways to raise that from 75% plus to 100% plus that don't involve cheating current beneficiaries. For instance, right now, people who make more than $110,000 a year pay nothing towards Social Security. If we scrapped the cap, then Social Security would be able to pay out full benefits from now until the end of time. Another example is we could, for instance, uh, apply the Social Security tax to Mitt Romney. Uh, Mitt Romney doesn't have to pay Social Security tax on his capital gains, on his dividends. That's why he ended up with a 16 or 15 or 14 percent tax rate. Right. Um, if, if Mitt Romney had to pay Social Security taxes like you and I do, then, in the, and then we wouldn't have this problem at any time at all ever in the future. What it is, it's an excuse. And it's, a, it's an excuse that's meant to, to give rein, to give free rein to the right-wing impulse to hurt seniors, hurt poor people, hurt sick people. And by poor people, I mean those people who use Medicaid, uh, sick people, those people who rely upon Medicaid or Medicare, uh, to, to, to take away anything that we do for ourselves through social insurance, right. deprive us of it, break the promises that have been made uh, in order to turn America into a country of cheap labor, 
where people work until they die. Well, Congressman, what do you say about uh, the White House going around saying that there will be exemptions uh, for the very old and the very poor under chain CPI? Does that make it more palatable? No. I mean, what does that mean, that it's okay to cheat people who are 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, and 75, but not people who are 76, 77, or 78? Right. That doesn't make any sense. Right. That's ridiculous. If it's a bad idea, it's a bad idea equally for everyone. Absolutely. Uh, and speaking of bad ideas and bad ideas for everyone, uh, why would the Democratic Party actually support this? Congressman, we know that you actually circulated a letter saying that if any, uh, any proposal came down that included the chain CPI, that you would vote against it. How many members of the Democratic Party signed on to that letter? 30. 30. Mm -hmm. What does it mean that only 30 members of the Democratic Caucus and rec recall that pro uh, the Social Security and Medicare programs were implemented by Democrats, only 30 promised to vote against something that included this kind of deal. Uh, it means that roughly 170 of them need to be primaried uh, next year. That's what that means. And that's not something I say lightly, because I am a loyal and strong Democrat. It means a lot to me. I, um, I'm one of the few Democrats in the South that actually runs as a Democrat and votes as a Democrat. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud to do so. But the, the, the fact of the matter is we need a lot of people. There's just too many people, starting from the president on down, who think that any deal is better than no deal, even if it's a bad deal. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they run around with their, their, their pride and their power, uh, saying, well, I'm going to decide these things for America, without giving any thought to what it actually means. Mm -hmm. and, and what it does, in a very deep sense, is it deprives the voters of any choice. Right. You know, now we have one party, uh, if, if the president's proposal stands, we have one party that wants to destroy Social Security, and we never have another party wants to compromise with them. Right. That's not what the voters deserve. That's like choosing between Diet Coke and Coke Zero. Right, right. People deserve a choice. The people the do deserve a choice. The party that created Social Security is the party that should preserve Social Security, not the party to help destroy it. So I think people are con confused. They, many people don't know that there's a split within the Democratic Party, that you have this group called the New Democrats, who kind of ascribe to a neoliberal agenda that's focused on really kowtowing to big business. And big business, let us uh, make no mistake, uh, is for cutting Social Security and Medicare benefits, cutting social insurance. In fact, uh, the, 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 um, the Business Roundtable, uh, the Fix the Debt Coalition, Pete Peterson, and other wealthy Wall Street actors uh, have been arguing this uh, for this cut, uh, for these kinds of cuts for quite some time. And so the new Democratic uh, portion of the Democratic caucus uh, has been leaning in that direction. Uh, and yet you have progressives who are on the other side of this. Do you think that progressives will be strong in holding uh, the, the line against any kind of incursions against these programs? Well, frankly, the president's position makes that difficult for people because mm -hmm. it's, it's very difficult to face the media, to face your own constituents, and to have people say, well, you know, the president's okay with this. How come you're not? Right. And, and you, we saw that uh, with the vote, um, my last vote, actually, when I was a former member of Congress. My last vote uh, with regard to the extension of the Bush, the Bush tax breaks for the rich. Mm -hmm. uh, the president came out with his so-called compromise, which I thought was barely a compromise, mm -hmm. uh, and, and extended the Bush tax breaks for the rich for two years and cut out the legs from under those progressives who said no, it's not doing any good. It's not. They're not creating any jobs. They're simply stuffing more money into the pockets of the rich, the, mo the millionaires, the billionaires, the multinational corporations. Right. And 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 we we sh if we're serious about doing something about deficit, we have to end this now. And the president uh, supported it. So the result of that was that 95 Democrats voted for it, and 95 Democrats voted against it. It split the party right down the middle. And that's what happens when you know our our leader is is essentially. Uh, adopting the other side's talking points. We've now reached the point where the Republicans are holding a hearing uh, this week in the House. The Republicans are holding a hearing in the House about all of the cuts in Social Security and Medicare that they say the president supports. Right. And, and it's so true. He's providing cover for them and making it impossible for us to, well, or at least very difficult for us to make progress toward taking back the House.
Well, that is the primary question. Why would Nancy Pelosi uh, go along with something like this, knowing that the, her members actually have to face re-election and that they're seeking to take back the House, and that a majority of the American public, Democrat, Republican, and Independent, actually support these programs? Well, uh, if you look at the polling, it's remarkable. Uh, you know, if you, if you ask the question straight up, do, do you support cuts in Social Security and Medicare benefits? An absolutely overwhelming number of Americans say no. You know, something on the order of 80 or almost 90 percent say no to that question. Right. And then if, if you spin the question a bit and you say, do you support cutting Social Security and Medicare benefits in order to reduce the debt and rein in our deficit, the answer is still no, and it's still overwhelmingly no. It's something on the order of 70 to 75 percent no, even if you twist and spin the question that way. Right. And then, you know, so the question is, like, how could anybody possibly believe this is politically intelligent? Right. And the answer is that there, there, there's been polling that's been done out of the White House and elsewhere that says, do you want a balanced approach to reducing the deficit without actually indicating that that balanced approach is, in the eyes of the White House, something that would incorporate cuts in Social Security and Medicare? Mm -hmm. And then you get a bare majority of people saying, yeah, I mean, I prefer balanced to imbalanced. Uh, without even knowing what they're answering. Right. And, and that somehow becomes the political cover for this abomination. Right. Uh, that, that becomes the political rationale. But we are approaching the point where the only major decision in people's lives in America is paper or plastic hmm. at, at the checkout counter. They're, they're not being given any right to decide their own fate, their own future, through political means. Right. And that, that's, that's really tragic. And they're being I think sold. People are entitled to a choice. And they're being sold this line about shared sacrifice uh, that you know everybody has a role to play in paying down the deficit, and you know uh, so nothing should be a sacred cow or exempt. When Mitt Romney pays as much in taxes as you do, get back to me on shared sacrifice. Right. And actually, let's talk about how we got into this in the first place. Uh, not only, you know, two unfunded wars abroad, you know, an unfunded prescription drug benefit, uh, the unfunded tax cuts, but then uh, the Wall Street actors taking our economy over a cliff, the huge bailouts, uh, the huge yawning deficit and debt created by uh, the Great Recession. Uh, this was a crisis created for and by the wealthy, and yet they're seeking to actually have everyday ordinary working uh, and retired working Americans pay uh, for this uh, fiscal crisis that was not created for them or by them. Uh, so is this not indeed a, a transfer of wealth uh, from low income and middle class populations uh, to subsidize uh, higher income folks? It's a further transfer of wealth. We're already at the point where this nation is as unequal as, as it was uh, just before the Great Depression hit in 1929. Uh, we have, uh, in some respects, a worse distribution of income, a worse distribution of assets than we did in 1929, just before the Great Depression. And when you look at who's benefited from the recovery, the top 10% have benefited from all of the recovery. There hasn't been any recovery at all for the bottom 90%, according to the work of uh, Professor Science. And, and and you ask yourself, where is all this heading? Right. Where does this end up? Do we end up with the one percent owning absolutely everything, and the ninety nine percent simply providing cheap labor to them? That would be that's a surf the direction system. Where this is heading? That's a feudal and, system. Yes, that's right. It's a, it's a feudal system in this case where people are not not chained by the feudal system itself, but chained by the debt that they incur uh, for, from having to survive. That's right. And, and that debt becomes the chains uh, that bind them. And, and that debt is, is held by the, the 1%. So, let's so, I mean, it, 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 the situation is not getting better. It's getting worse. And, and the, the underlying rationale for this is this bizarre misconception. There's some kind of moral equivalence between asking um, the, 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 the filthy rich, the, you know, the people who in many cases stole their money, uh, to pay some modest amount of their money in taxes uh, versus stealing from the poor, right. stealing from old people, stealing from sick people, that, that somehow those two things are the same. You know, when we introduced our letter asking members of Congress to promise that they would vote against cuts in Social Security and Medicare benefits, 
a reporter came to me and said to me, well, this sounds like the other side. This sounds like the promise that the Republicans make that they, they won't raise taxes on the rich. And I said, yeah, just like a fish is like a bicycle. <laughs> How could you possibly think that, that asking millionaires and billionaires and multinational corporations to pay something resembling the same amount of their income that ordinary people pay, how can you say that that's the same as stealing Social Security benefits, stealing Medicare benefits, stealing Medicaid benefits that people pay for in their salaries every single time that they get a paycheck? You hear it her you heard it here first, uh, Congressman. You are speaking truth to power. Uh, the proposal that's being put forth uh, can be seen as a transfer of wealth from low-income middle-class populations to higher-income individuals it can be seen as theft because these are earned benefits and where is this heading the end game uh, is the question uh, do you think that this will be put up against a uh, the, the debt ceiling showdown again will you be forced uh, to actually choose between uh, whether we actually renege on the full faith and credit of the US government uh, or whether we make cuts to Social Security and Medicare benefits well, the Republicans look at the polls, and they see that right now they have a, a nationwide deficit of 8%. Uh, if the election were held today, the Democrats would get 8% more than the Republicans. And despite all of their gerrymandering and the power of their dirty money, uh, their, their, their special interest money that just pours into one race after another, they know that they will lose the House uh, if that trend continues. Uh, they know that. Uh, they can only cheat so much. Uh, and, and, you know, their basic philosophies, you can't beat them, cheat them, but that only takes you so far. So I think that the Republicans understanding that are becoming a little bit more reluctant to toss this country into one artificial crisis after another, after another, whether it's the sequester, whether it's the tax breaks, uh, wh whether it's the, the, the debt limit, whether it's the markdown in the, in the value of our credit, whatever it might be. They, they have become crisis junkies. Mm -hmm. But the fact is they realize it's not good for them anymore, just like it's not good for the rest of us. So I think that they have walked back from that ledge. We'll All see. right. Congressman Alan Grayson, can you stay with us a little bit longer after the break? Sure. All right. We'll be joined by Nancy Altman, co-director of Social Security Works. Uh, right after the break, you are listening to Pivot Point with Meyer Rockymore, sponsored by the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. Stay with us.